Okay, uh, we have our uh, adult congenital heart disease talk, so let's kind of refocus a little bit. Uh, Eunice Karanja, our nurse practitioners in adult congenital heart disease, will give you an overview of adult congenital heart disease. Eunice, great to have you. Thank you for having me today on behalf of uh, Dr. Huey Lin, who is uh, not here, but at an international conference in Toronto. So today, I'm hoping to give you a little bit about the history, the prevalence, and the future of adult congenital heart disease. I will highlight one of the cases, and then we'll talk about some other types of uh, congenital heart lesions, and then how they affect our patients. We'll discuss indications for referrals, and then also talk about important and expected issues uh, seen with our patients in adult congenital heart disease. So how many of you watch Jimmy Kimmel? Uh, show of hands. How many of you learned about Tetralogy of Fallot during his uh, airing about a year ago when his son was born with Tetralogy of Fallot? Uh, if you recall, uh, Dr. Oz was on air and they talked about Tetralogy of Fallot and actually had a diagram depicting what the lesion looks like. Later on, he was repaired and he's doing well and the dad reports that he is uh, currently progressing as any other young uh, uh, child would. So let's talk about the prevalence and the future of congenital heart disease. In 1953 was the first initial cardiopulmonary bypass that uh, was used in repair of atrial septal defect. Prior to that, in 1944, the BT shunt was uh, invented. And thereafter, 1954, the trilogy of fallow repair. In 1963, the muscle repair of the transposition of great arteries followed by uh, Norwood Glenn Fontaine for the hypoplastic left heart or the single ventricle in 1981. So to put that in perspective, the first hypoplastic left heart is approximately 37 years old today. So that brings us to what we now call adult congenital heart disease. So this diagram here is showing us that there is a changing demographics of patients in the United States admitted with congenital heart disease over the years. Between the year 98 and 2010, we see a gradual rise in the number of patients 18 and above in the dark gray, almost similar trending curve with the number of patients below the age of 18 being admitted in the hospital. So this patient population is growing and they're becoming adults and we need to know how to take care of them. So approximately, there's about 5% annual increase of patients with adult congenital heart disease. And this is about 1.4 million adults. By the year 2020, which is two years from now, we are expecting 2.2 million patients, 2.2 million adults to live with adult congenital heart disease. And to put that into better perspective, every 15 minutes, a child is born with congenital heart disease. And just here in Houston alone, most of you from Houston, uh, you can imagine there's about 30,000 patients with congenital heart disease and living with it in their adult life. So let's highlight the lesion of tetralogy of Fallot. And the reason I chose this lesion is because it, it consists of most of the lesions we see with congenital heart disease, the obstructive lesions as well as the shunts. So the tetralogy of Fallot involves um, four major uh, lesions, and this is the overriding aorta, uh, the pulmonary artery stenosis, as well as a VSD patch and RV hypertrophy. So initial repair for the patient involves closing the VSD with a patch, resecting the pulmonary artery and making it wider and applying a patch to allow for pulmonary blood flow, as well as reconstructing the RV outflow obstruction. And thereafter, patient will require a, pul a, pulmonary, a, pulmonary, a pulmonic valve replacement at some time in their life. So let's talk about this 36-year-old male with Tetralogy of Fallot who was repaired at the age of one. He comes into clinic and complains of occasional palpitations. And we do the EKG in the clinic and find out that he has ventricular tachycardia. This warrants for him to be admitted in the hospital for further evaluation to see what could be causing him to have these symptoms. And after he was admitted in the hospital, he underwent a cardiac MRI which showed he had severe pulmonic valve regurgitation, for which he was taken to the operating room for a surgical valve replacement. <clears throat> 
So why do we need to keep seeing this patient in the clinic? And the reason is um, we've seen the trends that pulmonic valves will last about 10 to 15 years, and thereafter they will require to be replaced. And so what this means is we have other options for percutaneous uh, valve replacement, and the Melody valve comes in for this patient in handy, and they don't have to undergo surgical valve replacement uh, multiple times in their lifetime. So what do we worry about the most with tetralogy of follow patients? The concern for asymptomatic doesn't mean that your patient really is free of symptoms. Always pry some more and ask them more questions. They will require a pulmonic valve replacement. The question is when. And so therefore, you need to do your due diligence to monitor these patients in the clinic. Some suffer from arrhythmias, some can be fatal, and some can even have sudden cardiac death if they're not monitored closely. Due to their initial repair, they, do have a, they could have aortic root aneurysms or aortic regurgitation. So when we do their surveillance monitoring, we also look for other things or other residual shunts or lesion that they may have. So with our tetralogy of flow, they always need constant uh, evaluation and probable re-intervention in their lifetime. So there are many, many other congenital heart disease lesions, but I'll just highlight on a few that we see most commonly in our clinics, in the hospitals, um, and hopefully this will also uh, relay the information on how to manage these patients in the clinic. So we have obstructive types of lesions. They're both right-sided and left-sided lesions. The right-sided obstructive lesions involve tricuspid stenosis, subvalva PS, valva PS, supravalva PS, and pulmonary artery stenosis. And as you can see, this will likely affect the right side of the heart, and so patients will have your typical like symptoms such as shortness of breath, decreased lung ventilation should you do a BQ scan, RV hypertension is not uncommon, as well as elevated pulmonary artery pressures. These patients ultimately can suffer from RV failure if not managed uh, well and accordingly. Left-sided obstruction, we have um, mitral valve stenosis, subvalva AS, valva AS, supravalva AS, and uh, coactation, and as well as mid aortic stenosis. So your patients will typically present with typical symptoms of left-sided heart failure. For coactation uh, patients, they will have a gradient in their blood a gradient in their blood pressures as well as a gradient across the aortic valve once you've done the echocardiography. Uh, they may sometimes have left-sided heart failure symptoms, lower extremity edema, dyspnea on exertion, and so therefore you need to evaluate them further or send them to a cardiologist for evaluation. So we'll talk about shunts, which is very common, and we see a lot of shunts diagnosed later on in life. And we have pretricuspid shunts, which is your atrioceptor defect, and these usually predispose the patient to right-sided heart failure. Your post-tricuspid shunts is your VSDs and your PDAs, and they predispose patients to left-sided heart failure as long as they have normal pulmonary valve uh, PVR. If they have isomanger type of syndrome or elevated pulmonic valve resistance, uh, they will end up with right-sided heart failure. So this types of patient would not necessarily undergo any type of closures as they, it would cause their pulmonary hypertension to worsen. Their other lesion uh, is discordance of the transpos uh, transposition of great arteries, where the patient is born with independent circulation, and obviously this would not sustain any life. So therefore, the patient initially would undergo an atrioseptostomy to allow for some degree of blood flow. Ultimately, they will require what's called an arterial switch, which is the best practice now, and that involves resecting the pulmonary artery as well as the aorta and reattaching them to their correct anatomical positions. With these types of patients, you want to be worried about them when they come to your clinic or are in the hospital complaining of chest pain uh, signs and symptoms. And the reason is because the aorta is resected and the coronary buttons are also re-implanted. So you could have a patient have restenosis or stenosis of coronary arteries. For these types of patients, Dr. Quinones mentioned that uh, CTA is usually a gold standard for uh, coronary evaluation, and that is what we typically do for our patients that come in that have had transposition of great arteries repair complaining of chest pain. That is the first thing we look for, is to make sure that coronaries are still patent. 
Uh, the most complex lesion is a single ventricle or the hypoplastic left heart. And this involves um, three types of palliations uh, for the patient. Initially, they receive what's called a BT shunt or Norwood. Subsequently, at stage two, they will get a Glen and ultimately the Fontan. And for adults, we see the patients uh, at their Fontan stage. And this is when we start to worry about how they are doing and we need close surveillance to monitor them for systolic heart failure, as well as protein losing enteropathy, liver failure, cirrhosis or carcinoma, as well as hemoptysis. And the reason being that these patients need um, adequate uh, management to prevent their fontan pressures from elevating and making sure that they don't have a gradient that's causing them to have any type of decompensation. So what are some of the expected long-term complications with congenital heart disease patients? Typically, you will see heart failure-like symptoms, endocarditis, uh, sometimes because of the uh, types of devices they've used to uh, plug up the ASDs, VSDs, or their pulmonic valves. Uh, they may be subjected to arrhythmias if they've had early uh, surgery or they've had neonatal surgery. And ultimately, some may have pulmonary hypertension as, um, as, as a side effect from the surgical repair or acquire it later on in life. Valvular stenosis and regurgitation is not uncommon. We've already talked about the tetralogy of follow-up patient requiring a pulmonic valve replacement later on in life. Paradoxical embolism is uh, usually seen with patients who have had an atrial sw a switch procedure for transposition of great arteries as they have a baffle procedure done during uh, their initial surgery that can predispose them to that type of uh, event. Now, our patients uh, do tend to get pregnant uh, against advice and with advice. And so they may have pregnancy-related type of complications. Obviously, they're higher risk and they require maternal fetal medicine for the baby's sake and as well as for the mother. And so they do need diligent guidance to make sure that they carry their pregnancy uh, uh, healthy and to term to sustain the baby and the mom's life. Um, in summary, it's important that each patient diagnosed with a congenital heart disease uh, maintain and establish care with a ACHD specialists. Also maintain PCP care to ensure that there is adequate referral. And as they get older, they acquire other medical issues and medical challenges. And so we need to be able to have someone uh, to close the gap and make sure that these other issues are monitored. Also, there are simple lesions, uh, such as ASDs and VSDs, which are closed and the patients seem to do well. So we need to monitor these patients main, primarily on an annual-like basis. However, for complex lesions, such as single ventricle, we need to see these patients more frequently to undergo cross-sectional imaging by cardiac MRI, by echocardiography, by transesophageal echocardiogram, or even cardiac catheterization to estimate their pressures to make sure that we optimize their care. Always be suspicious of asymptomatic, um, refer early and often, and it's, it's, it's important to identify a tertiary care center to ensure that your patient is being cared for by people who have knowledge of how to manage an adult congenital patient. Thank you. Thank you, Eunice, for an amazing presentation.